morning. Welcome to our uh, session today, uh, talking about the uh, Voices from COP27 and the uh, delegation that went to uh, Sharm El Sheikh and their responses uh, gathering here today in our various um, traditional areas, traditional lands, our relationships with the First Nations and Métis Inuit people that uh, populated this, these areas before our settler relatives came to this area, came to these lands. I'm going to uh, begin us with a smudge. It is uh, morning here, sun rising, which is the traditional time for our elders to uh, take time for prayer, take time to remember our connection to Creator. We light a smudge as a sign of our faithfulness and understanding of the tradition that when we gather those elements of creation, we put them together in this form to offer our prayer, to offer our communion with God. And so the smoke rising carries our prayers to the Creator. Let us pray. Creator God, God of blessing, God of creation, God of knowing, and God of love. We gather here in this space as a reminder of our connection to you and to this creation, how we are on these lands, how we enjoin ourselves to your mystery, to your love, to all the bounty of this world that you have given over, that we might learn to live in harmony with your creation and with one another. We pray where we have failed. We pray where we need instruction. We pray when we have troubles and challenges as we do this day and many days to come. We pray for those that come after us, the next generations that will have to deal with the issues and the shortcomings of our way of thinking and our way of life. We pray that you will be with them to guide them in their hope, in their future. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Om Chagezi Twa Om Chagezi, Jesus Christ, Om Chagezi, Chagezi, Chagawa Ka, Wahogu, Harichin, Narizi, Narigi, Chabichan, Nagahaz, Nagucha, Neajia. Amen. Thank you. That is something that we uh, continue to practice that was banned and outlawed from our uh, traditions during the residential school era and something that we continue to remember in our uh, dealings with uh, Canada, with settler populations and those that came after and all those that can hear these words. I'm going to turn it over first to our uh, panel on Women, Peace, Security, and Climate Change, Conflict and Gender, gender Inequities. Uh, we are moving uh, quickly through the agenda as we have some people who will be leaving in, in the next little while. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nelson, uh, who is a uh, consultant with the president of uh, Green Sky Consulting, Sustainability Consulting uh, Incorporated and with the Mennonite Church. Uh, Nelson, if you can take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Uh Thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, we have a somewhat of a change in our schedule. So first of all, we're going to, I mean, the topic we have is women, peace and security and climate change and then conflict and gender in inequity. So that, that confluence of where, where all that overlaps. And uh, I think our first speaker will be uh, Juan Rachel Michael Roberto. And uh, she's a advocacy coordinator for the South Sudan Council of Churches. Um, and that, that council has been a long-term uh, ecumenical and Kairos partner. Uh, Juan works to analyze peace processes, in particular the, that revitalization agreement on the resolution of conflict in the South Sudan. Uh, she describes her work as um, advocacy on issues to do with gender-based violence and inclusion of women and youth in peace and governance. She also, of course, working on climate change. Uh, and you can imagine with things like floods, uh, no access to food, uh, clean drinking water and whatnot. So this COP is probably very relevant. Uh, 
uh, uh, Juan, um, if you can hear me, the, the main question is, you know, what was your experience of COP? Um, any, any significant takeaways? And, and welcome to. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. Uh, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to Hannah. I know we, we have the same time. Um, I want to thank Kairos Canada for facilitating um, us to go to Sham and be part of the COP27. Um, my experience was really new because it was my first time to be part of COP. Um, and being the 27th COP, um, I'm just thinking, we're having this the 27th time and the conversations are still the same. But I like the fact that um, there were different identities and this time um, I used to watch over the, the TV, but now I was there physically and I was seeing indigenous people part of the table and also advocating for things that are very important to them. And I think that really stood out for me and also innovations by young people. That's my takeaway. Um, I used to see young people uh, using plastics to make small things, but now I see big things like art, um, mechanical stuff. So it really shows that there's a response at the local level that needs to be supported. And um, I've also seen the young people reaching out to the communities, the grassroots, using whatever capacity that they have. So that was really very important for me. And then I've also realized that it's still a challenge for African countries to respond to climate change, regardless of the fact that they are the most affected and they don't have access to the funds. And, and we know the many reasons as to why this is happening. But being part of COP, I was able to see other African people that are also pushing for this so that I can just share that as my a summary of my experience. But I just want to say it was very thrilling um, to connect with everyone and a built network. So it was really good for me. Thank you very much, uh, Joan. Yeah, I, I, in my experience too, uh, is a mixture of, uh, well, it's hope there's so many people, but uh, it is a big challenge, isn't it? Um, so how, how will that shape your work on these issues going forward then? Um, do, you, do you have any new plans, anything new you might like to do? Because Oh, yes. Um, we have been raising awareness around climate change, but has, it hasn't been the center. But attending COP27, it made me really to connect how conflict can come as a result of climate change. Mm. So there will be more awareness raising on response to climate change from the community level. I'm also planning uh, in my department of advocacy to design or to draft a policy paper so that we raise awareness at the level of uh, parliament. And then also in, uh, in vastly include climate change in our work, um, regardless of the fact that we have peace as the priority, but we also want to make climate change as the priority. So attending COP has really opened my eyes, if I could use that, um, to how serious and how urgent it is for African countries or the world at large to respond to climate change. So it's really going to shape my work. Good enough, uh, we're starting a new year, so it will be easier for me to plan now um, my advocacy around that. Mm, thank you very much, Joanne. Uh, you used opening your eyes. Another term is like putting on climate lenses and seeing things <laughs> through that uh, perspective. Um, uh, with that vein, I know we're kind of short on time, but uh, what about a message for Canada? Um, is there any message you would have for the Canadian public? Yes, um, a lot. Well, I, I have a few things to say. Um, first, it's on the capacity. We need to build our capacity on emergency response or having a early warning system. We don't have that in South Sudan. So if we can have some support from the Canadian government when they are lobbying for funds for South Sudan, they should put that at, at the center and they should also be funding on climate change response um, when it comes to capacity building and also the materials. We also need to have the materials and how we can advocate at the policy making level. Um, also holding to account, we need to hold our governments accountable and those that are causing climate change in our different countries. So I think the Canadian government can, can support South Sudan to do that and also hold their own governments and companies in South Sudan and other countries accountable for the loss and damage that they are causing. So I think that's what I can share on what the Canadian public and government can do when it comes to climate change in Africa or in South Sudan in particular. 
Thank you, Nelson. Thank you very much, Joan. Um, uh, you mentioned loss and damage. That's, that's one uh, item that's particularly of interest to me. And I, I know uh, the, the developing nations like Canada being one of them, of course, try to say, well, we might be willing to contribute some money to that fund, but it's not because we owe it. You know, it's not because we're responsible. It's because maybe we're good people or something like that. Uh, well, how do you see loss and damage? Well, when it comes to loss and damage, it's very emotional for me um, from the level of my community. Uh, we have lost the tombs of our ancestors to floods. They've been washed away. And this is damage caused by floods. Um, and then we're seeing communities burning rubbish, causing acidic rains, um, the drought and the food insecurity. It's very personal and it needs to be responded to immediately. It makes me very emotional to talk about loss and damage because I am feeling it and experiencing, a, a experiencing, ex experiencing it at the moment. And when I go to the community or to my village, I see what's happening. I see how people are looking for food. I see how people are being submerged into water and they can't cook. So it's, it's, it's an urgency. We, we need to respond immediately. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and of course, we're for, for the love of creation is more, more ecumenical of uh, churches, um, uh, Christians. Um, we have the duty. Uh, well, I don't know if it, duty is the right word, but we should love one another, love our neighbor. Um, uh, yeah. How can we make you more of our neighbor? Um, how do we see you more as our neighbor? Well, uh, a neighbor is a uh a big word. I mean, people make it seem like it's someone who is just next to you, but I think it's everyone that you have far away or close, any human being, because you share the same blood, the same body, same soul, you were created by the same person. So any hand that you reach out to is your neighbor, and you are a neighbor to someone, and you are in need. And, and, and I think the churches in South Sudan are trying to do that in their humanitarian response, uh, by raising awareness on what's happening in flood affected areas and providing some humanitarian support as well. I work with an ecumenical body, so I know what you're talking about. And this is what we preach every Sunday uh, to reach out to our neighbors. And a neighbor is just a human being like you. So I think that's how I can answer that. Exactly. We need to hear those kind of sermons more in our own churches, I think. Um, are there any questions um, uh, from the audience? Um, and I know, I don't know how many more, more minutes you have with us, uh, Juan. I have a minute. <laughs> oh, yeah, one minute. Yeah. Is there a question? Other yeah, otherwise, um, you know, I would li like to thank you. And, and, and again, apologize, uh, we mix up the time zones. Uh, that's the craziest thing that we do in the world, I think. But um, thank you very much for, uh, for being here. I pray uh, you're um, invigorated and have much uh, success in, in, your, in, in what you're gonna be doing in the next year or so. Thank you, Blessings thank to you. you so much. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you all, I hope to see you soon. Bye bye, okay. Ah. Okay, so uh, now I think we can continue on with the rest of our panel, is that right? And I'm, I'm trying to think of who is here, um, I believe, I have. I'm, I'm going uh, to spotlight them if they put on their cameras. Good. Okay. And yeah, I, I um, I'm just going to go by my order here. Um, I have uh, Hannah Elias Anton Kerr uh, from the WM, it's the West Bank, uh, Palestinian uh, area. She's from the Palestine Conflict Transformation Center. Of course, uh, it focused on uh, women, peace, and security, and, and YM has been a, another long-term ecumenical and Kairos partner. And and she, um, what Hannah says is uh, the climate crisis is progressing faster than government and civil society can handle. And I can imagine with all the troubles, it's just one more thing, um, like a threat multiplier, is how climate change has been uh, addressed. And of course, women and girls tend to suffer even the most, right? They're uh, always the most vulnerable. So we'll hear from Hannah. Uh, we also have, um, 
next one is um, Kelly uh, Johanna Campo uh, Kara. I hope I got that right or even close from the uh, Organization uh, Femina Popular, uh, which I say in English would be like the popular feminist organization. They're responsible for the feminist uh, popular economy and environmental programs. And uh, Kelly is also a youth leader in that uh, in the, this organization. Um, she mentioned um, the work that she does is in Colombia and the territory um, is uh, you know a workplace has um, been been uh, I guess uh, been affected by uh, climate change. Um, there's an extractive economy, of course, petrochemical. We have that here in Canada. We're very much in that mode. So we can relate to what you have to say. And then um, I, let's see, we have, oh, sorry, pardon me. Um, oh, excuse me, I'm working on two computers. <laughs> uh, Yvonne Yanis, and she's a founding member of the, and, and the current president of um, Acción Ecologica, uh, it's an Ecuador organization. And uh, she's also a well, well known and respected climate justice uh, um, advocate and a member of Oil Watch. And I remember uh, one of her colleagues uh, I, um, from Africa, they have a slogan, keep the oil in the soil. And it's another, uh, you know, Canada, big oil producer, and we're trying to work on that area too. So very uh, relevant for us uh, today. So. I I think that's our three panelists. And just to put the context. So um, your countries are where you've come from. Uh, you continue to face the impact of uh, a protracted conflict and then with climate change on top of it, like a threat multiplier, as I said. So um, I'd like to start with one question for all of you um, to walk through is uh, what was your experience at COP27? Um, you know, what's a maybe one significant takeaway from, from COP27? And um, uh, Hannah, do you want to start? Or? I think uh, Kelly will have to leave at nine, so we might oh, want to go. Okay, sorry. Thanks, Tony. How about Kelly? Vale, muchas gracias. Eh, Great, thanks very much. Well, first of all, I have to tell you that I'm very, very happy. We're uh, very glad and thankful with this process and this opportunity of being part of COP27. This is the very first COP that I am part of from my organization. And well, to us, this is a, a very fulfilling process. It's been uh, an experience for dimensioning the uh, impact that climate change has worldwide for all people and well, mainly for women, and also to dimension and know and get to know different processes of women that are also working for climate justice. It's a, a, an outlook from the impact of women when it comes to climate justice, that is also gender justice, that it's also a matter of human rights, that it's also uh, a very important understanding to be able to face this process in the fight against climate change that is also a, a process of fight of uh, saving life and the most important reflections that i have now is that this might be the last battle that we have to fight for saving the life that we know as we know it now and it seems that we're losing that battle in my country, at least in the region where I'm located here in Latin America, we are facing the climate impact in a very fast and accelerated way. We are now saying that we are in an emergency, in a climate emergency, suffering floodings because of uh, rains. Women have a, the highest impact. Women are the ones that have an impact and they're the last ones to, to save, to, to be saved because they're looking after their children or because they're looking after adults or because they're in bad work that does not let them uh, be safe or because they haven't had access to educational systems that allow them to understand system warning systems or to be aware of all these situations. So yeah, going to cup and see how other women in other places of the world 
in the global south or in the north or in indigenous communities as well, how they have an impact that's differentiated and it's very aggressive and very specific. So this has been very enriching to see all these it's one of the most important experiences that I have in, uh, that I had in COP sharing with others. And as Rachel was saying earlier, also to creating networks uh, for strengthening this collective exercise of this fight against climate change in order to speak about climate justice. So that's one of the most important things that I keep from COP and also with, a, with, a, with mixed feelings like thinking in these exercises that we don't reach agreements, that, well, we finally, after so many efforts and an event, and a worldwide event where lots of important people attended, where we had very important decision makers, um, that they're reaching this agreement for generating specific uh, strategies that would allow us to stop the, the accelerated climate change that we're facing. So this also uh, leads to different uh, feelings like anger, mixed feelings, sadness, I feel powerless because we, we cannot change that result. Uh, agreements are not reached. So in spite of that, being part of it is uh, meeting others so, so that we strengthen this collective exercise so that we understand the other fights so that we can also generate processes or actions that would allow us to move forward that uh, feed this process that we women have here in, in Colombia. So yeah, without a question, participating was a very fulfilling experience. And, in, and this makes us think about other things, what, what else we can keep doing in order to fight climate change and to talk about climate justice. So, so well, very thankful, very happy with this experience. And we're now thinking in how to strengthen this, uh, government, uh, this movement and how to have more uh, advocacy. So, because it's sometimes, this is not prioritized. Climate change is not prioritized, but women have, put this in the agenda because that's where we also have to create uh, uh, policies that allow us to, to protect natural resources, but life, life as a whole, the life that we have now, uh, because we are in a humanitarian emergency, in a climate emergency. Yeah, well, well said, Kelly. Um, and I guess it's, it's encouraging on the one hand to find a lot of uh, other women at, at COP who are in the same boat but it's a sad thing that you have to be in that boat, right? The climate change. So, uh, what do you have? A couple of things. I'll maybe focus on you because you have to go. Uh, do you have any uh, next steps, like what you will do because of uh, COP? Um, how you'll change maybe your approach or or something like that? Uh, sí, creo que hay varios... Well, yes, yeah. There are several things that change when when you have this type of global experiences. The first thing for the process and more collective uh, processes is that we're thinking how our education schools, when it comes to environmental aspects, uh, should focus more on, so, on, on climate justice. We've been working on environment, the protection of the territory, but now talking about climate justice is, um, is a different approach. It is a more frontal approach that uh, allows us to understand more uh, in a more a more comprehensive vision of this uh, environmental fight of women. To talk about climate justice, yeah, that's what I want to do now, and how that's connected now what we are doing here at OFP. That's a human rights advocacy. They're not different things. But uh, we can speak about um, education, climate education, justice, and, and also it includes human rights. That's is key to us. And that leads to peace construction. When we can leave all possible lives in peace, that's a comprehensive peace. That is uh, what we have, uh, uh, that's a vision that we have. So yeah, that's a very important topic to us. And we will keep approaching these topics uh, more plea and also public policies. We've been working in public policies in economy, and we want that public policy in economy has an approach of climate justice, or that it can somehow touch that big area that uh, that 
that big thing that's uh, climate justice and how we women are living these health we want to find out more. Well, we're talking about education, public policies, and research. We want to elaborate on the on the impact that this has on women's health. What um, these uh, extractive actions uh, have an impact in our health in a region. So these would be the three main areas that we're thinking after uh, COP. How to strengthen this in our process? Mm, thank you very much. Muchas you know, gracias. Canada has a trade agreement with Colombia, and I, uh, I wonder if you un, see any eh, Canadian, con Canadians working there. Um, y no sé si we, we all can talk about ahí. human rights. Right? Los like humanos. to stand for that. Do you think Canadians are doing that? Are we doing enough? Um, well, pues, bueno, es una, es una... Uh, well, well, that is a an important question and deep question. I don't know if this is a question for everyone. So how much are we all doing? I think that mainly with Canada, we've always had a, a very important relationship of a, a deep accompanying in this fight against uh, human rights. We've been working with Kairos for lots of years already. And we've always said, that that international relationship, that presence, that accompaniment of an international community has saved lots of life for us, for our processes, for the processes of our neighbors of the region. So yeah, we think that they've done a lot, but we also think that we still need a lot to do in this new time of a humanitarian crisis that we're facing. Of course, more has to be done. So there are things that we have to keep doing this comprehensive uh, accompanying because it's not just economical. We also have a political support that has mm. saved uh, lots of life. To us, this has been a very important thing. So there's also a lot of presence in our territory of Canadian companies that are ex extracting mm. resources. So support or this should be shared and uh, informed in Canada. We've spoken about this, what these extractivism companies do should be more shared in Canada. So it's important what they have to do in Canada. So th that's very important for defending human rights here in Colombia. Yeah, well, where I am in BC, Kelly, uh, uh, the mining industry is, is very big and, and they tell us yeah, that, yes, we are very, um, how to say, very sustainable and very proactive at taking care of um, uh, the local people. I, I sure hope that's the case. Um, what, what about the possibility of partnerships between Canadian churches and, and Colombian churches? I mean, for, for better communication, right? To keep um, perhaps these mining companies on, uh, honest, if you will. Well, yes, I think that those networks are key. We in our organization, we are a non-sectarian organization. We do have, uh, we, we, we also have connection as with church. We, we uh, our organization comes from the Christian um, church. So our organization works um, with the church, but when we have these networks that we can strengthen between church and communities here and communities in in Canada, that helps us uh, be civilized what happens here, that it does not stay here, that other people uh, see it, that they can know what happens and that they can support what's happening here. So those communication networks are very important. We usually are Raising this awareness of the situation, actually on November the 25th, we had a, a press release of Voices of Women speaking about the violent uh, situation that human, that women and girls are suffering here in our region. Mm. So this is a press release supported by the Catholic Church 
and that it would be very important that it could be replicated or that it could be strengthened also in, in Canada so that it can be visibilized. It's uh, uh, very shameful, the situation here. Life is in a crisis. Natural resources are at risk. This climate emergency it has everyone overwhelmed. Women are overwhelmed. Women are in the solidarity campaign so that we can help them. And so we need to strengthen this. They, they have to be visibilized. These uh, complaints have to be seen all over uh, uh, the world. And, if, and these networks could also help help these uh, complaints be stronger. Well, thank you very much, Kelly. I, I understand you have to go. We're, we're glad to have you. And yes, uh, there's a, a, a call to order for the Canadian churches to uh, strengthen those, those uh, communication and, and, and maybe try to make a difference. Thank you very much, Kelly. All the best in your day, and thanks for joining us. Um, so, so now we. We'll, yeah. No, thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, and, and I appreciate uh, Hannah, Yvonne be, being patient. To um, now, it's your turn. Uh, kind of the same same kind of questions, but uh, you know, starting off, um, maybe Hannah. What was your significant takeaway um, uh, and are you encouraged from COP at all? Yeah. Uh, hello everyone, it's really nice to uh, see you again. Uh, thank you, Nelson. And uh, really it was a great pleasure for me to be part of the COP 27. Uh, it is a very new experience to me where I was, I learned a lot uh, from COP27. Um, it was really uh, a bit confusing moving uh, around the buildings uh, and the pavilions uh, at COP, but seeing uh, many things, many experiences there um, lightened my mind and gave me more and more um, opened my uh, eyes to more things like seeing uh, seeing the Africans uh, really uh, talking about their experience and protesting of what uh, they really suffered from climate change and mm -hmm. seeing the indigenous people which all rely to uh, our situation in Palestine as well. Uh, also, uh, I, I tried to focus uh, on side events that uh, address issues on uh, gender. And Gender Day was really fabulous for me where I, I really learned that uh, from now on, we have to uh, talk about uh, women, not only as, or not as uh, victims and vulnerable, but as leaders. They are, mm. they should be, because they can do this, uh, and they should be the leaders wherever they are. It doesn't matter if they are uh, on a very high level or they are household uh, managers or uh, they are on the farm. Uh, they can really uh, do it. So we have to change this narrative of uh, having women as victims and to promote them as peacemakers and as agents of change. Uh, also, what impressed me, the SDGs, which also relies to our situation, where we are working in Palestine and within, with the organization, with WEAM, uh, in order to really uh, implement these SDGs and eliminate uh, gender-based violence, eliminate poverty, and create uh, jobs and uh, to make unemployment uh, become less and, uh, and less. Um, also, the issue of uh, uh, of water, where I try to really attend uh, some side events related to this, where uh, I learned uh, some of the experiences of uh, of some of the the, uh, the countries uh, about water, which we are really suffering from water uh, in Palestine, and uh, this is very important to create a new ideas on how to rationalize and be, know how to use water. Uh, what else is that um, 
um, I noticed that uh, change should start from uh, the government and come or, or come into the uh, communities. Uh, also, it's very important when I say this, that we start from the bottom up mm. and up to the bottom. This is very important uh, because uh, if I start uh, in my family changing, then this change can go to the outside uh, of the community. Uh, I noticed that uh, through COP27 that the whole world is a small village. We all share uh, the same uh, challenges. We all say, uh, share the same issues uh, of uh, still, uh, stolen land. And for example, when uh, Clifford had to do this uh, blanket exercise uh, and to talk about uh, the indigenous people of, Gan of Canada, this was very touching for me. And it really, I felt like it applies a lot uh, to my people and to and myself. Uh, so there was a lot to learn from there. And now I'm taking this, uh, what we have learned, the experience of other countries, the experience of the uh, civil society as well, which was present there, uh, into uh, my organization in order to start implementing and uh, working more and more into this field. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Hannah. Um, I, I like especially, you said you're not victims and, and uh, yes. yeah, focus on, on the leadership and not on just the blaming. Um, but exactly. Thank you. And let me turn over to, to Yvonne. What about, the, again, what your experience was and your, your main takeaway? Does it parallel Hannah at all? Um, muy buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to speak in Spanish. Thanks very much for translation and thanks very much both for the invitation today to share our, our feelings and our visions, but also thanks very much for uh, a part of the support that we got for participating in the ecological action at COP27. So the first thing that I wanted to say is that, well, I, I, I go to these climate change summits regularly. This was not my first summit, but um, it was the first summit, the first COP, where we did not have a summit of the people. When I go to these events, I go to the summit of people, the people to share our fights, design strategies to learn, to learn of the fight of other peoples. And this time, uh, a summit without the People Summit, this made that this was a very special summit in terms of, uh, well, the uh, little thing that we were able to do at this COP with social organizations was in the middle of a summit that totally illegitimate because for many years, this summit, this COP stopped being about climate change and it's just a business summit. Mm. So what I can tell, take from this summit is the big commitment of a social organization so that we can now in this context and in a country that's fully repressive so that we can do what we were able to do. And that's organizing events, side events, we organize side events, that's what I take. We were able to, to meet in all those gardens of COP, to march together in the entrance of COP, that is in these few spaces of democracy that exist. And this is not the very first time that we do it. Cops are always like that. Cops are always spaces of very little democracy. But this time was uh, a lot of uh, low democracy because of the context of the country and because there, this, we did not have a people summit this time. So my takeaway, that was my experience, my personal experience as a generous 
summit, but also what I take is that the strength of people summits to organize, to exchange strategies, to learn and to denounce, to, it's always there. So uh, this is the experience that I could share when it comes to the first question that you asked us from Kairos. Well, maybe it could continue on just a little bit, uh, Yvonne, like what, what you might change. I, I, I mean, it's too bad there, there wasn't um, that opportunity for the People's Summit or and uh, kind of repressive uh, democracy, as you mentioned. What, what would you do differently um, now? Um, you've been to a many cops. Is, is, is anything going to change for you? Well, I personally do not expect, okay, I go to COPS without any expectations that we can get positive results for peoples. That is the first thing. So I, I wouldn't put all my energy in changing COP, but I would put energy and effort so that we do not repeat a COP like this one, like the one we had now, and that we can have the possibility that COP28 will be the same or worse. I don't know, it's always worse, that, that is for sure, because it will be in a country where there are no uh, democratic participation processes, let alone women, and so I wouldn't invest energy in trying to change that. However, what I, what I would, uh, where I would put my energy is to try to imagine how to create a people summit in a context like this one. And well, uh, I want to share an experience with you. Now that I'm outside Egypt, there was an an attempt of organizing on, on the 21st and the 22nd in El Cairo, uh, a forum on climate justice with Egyptian organizations so that we could discuss climate justice, social changes, economic changes, political changes, and so forth. And two days before the event, the organizers got a phone call from the secret police from Egypt, telling them that if they organized that event, that they would be put in jail. It was plain as simple, mm -hmm. two days before that. So what we did was we were 15 people that we, we had our tickets for coming back on the 23rd. Some of them changed their tickets and they got back. Some of us did not change our tickets, so we stayed there. So what we did was we went to a hotel, to the Marriott Hotel, so that they don't think anything wrong because you know, if they listen to a, a capitalist, uh, if they listen to Marriott, they think that everything's okay. So we went to the Marriott Hotel, we rented the room, Nobody suspected anything there. And we had a hybrid event. So yeah, that is a, a political experience that we have to have as a lesson. So yeah, I'm sharing this because uh, uh, my conclusion is that we always can, can find a way to authoritarians. We can always uh, avoid all these uh, repression. We can dodge all this repression but we don't always have the possibility. And these are things that enrich our peoples. And that's how we organize this uh, meeting. And uh, well, it is a lesson and it is um, learnings that I take from, from this cup. Well, good for you, uh, Yvonne and all who are with you. Um, well, how about Hannah? I mean, uh, when it comes to repression, um, that sounds like a familiar theme you, you might be used to. Uh, what, what do you, what will you do differently as a result of your COP experience? Yeah, I think um, before I used uh, like to hear a lot of, from people that uh, climate change is not a priority for some uh, communities, for some people with all what is Palestine facing. But nowadays, after uh, COP27, I think it made a real change in people's mind. And uh, they are uh, now they started to know more about COP27 and how uh, they can address this. Uh, what change uh, we can make is now that we will work uh, intensively 
on this topic with other uh, partners locally and internationally as well uh, in order to uh, try to minimize the loss and damage that our people are facing due to climate change hazards and risks. Uh, for example, we am is now uh, brainstorming on a, on a plan that will last for not one year, two years, three years, 10 years maybe, okay, in order to uh, address this issue of climate change. Uh, we am already started earlier with some awareness campaigns with the community and with the youth, because the youth are very important. And this is what really uh, impressed me in uh, COP27, where many side events focused on the role of youth and their include, uh, inclusion in decision making uh, on topics related to, uh, to climate change. Um, so uh, uh, through we am. Uh, there will be many uh, campaigns raising awareness within the community, a cleaning uh, voluntary work with the community as well and the youth to raise awareness uh, that uh, we should keep our country uh, clean and uh, it looks more beautiful. Uh, there are, of course, many challenges with us as Palestinians and as civil society organizations uh, when we want to address this issue. But I think that it is very important for us uh, to try to dislink uh, the climate issue awareness with the political issues. We know that it, uh, the challenge is wide, uh, the challenge is uh, very high and it is risky, but we have to start doing this. Uh, so through we am, uh, there will be a planting of trees uh, 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 through this, we can uh, we can uh, fight uh, uh, the, uh, what is the word uh, desertification uh, because you know the problem with uprooting of uh, of olive trees that uh, Israel is, has been doing for years. And olive trees are very important for Palestinians. So uh, through the, um, uh, there will be more planting of trees in order to, uh, uh, to make a healthier uh, air and uh, that people can breathe a better, a better air and better uh, life, of course. Uh, also, there will be a campaign uh, on the importance of uh, women participation in climate change and being leaders uh, there, there will be more, uh, uh, maybe online courses as well, not only face to face, maybe we can use the international uh, uh, community to participate in this in helping uh, us to uh, learn lessons from um, from uh, lessons from all over the world uh, uh, as well. Also uh, about recycling water, how to use water, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, for us, uh, Israel uh, have access on 85% of uh, water resources, where Palestinians only have uh, access over 25%. This always uh, uh, give us less water and less land, of course, when we talk about land confiscation and, uh, la uh, and land stealing also. Uh, so uh, we we need to know or, or to teach to the community, uh, women, men, children, everybody. It's not only the role of women to rationalize water and to know how to. Everybody has to participate in this in order to be able to have more water. Uh, the community also should know how to preserve water like for example cisterns uh, when there there is rain this is mm. very uh, important also the use of pesticides and fertilizer uh, it is very important to raise and this is what we am is really uh, uh, thinking of doing and they have already started doing this with the community that to use a uh, compost and uh, uh, fertilizers from natural uh, materials rather than the chemical ones which are really causing harm to women 
and causing more cancer and especially uh, breast cancer to women. We want really to start uh, minimizing all these risks that women and youth and the community are facing uh, in, uh, in our uh, country. Um, what else? <laughs> okay, the use of plastic also. Uh, people mm -hmm. nowadays, they are aware more of that. Okay, we don't want to use cu uh, cups of plastic or let's use the ones that we can reuse and that we can wash again and use because this will make our uh, environment a better environment. Uh, uh, sorry? No, no, keep going, keep going yeah, sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, so this is, this is, uh, there are, of course, lots, lots of ideas that we are brainstorming and we want, of course, uh, the help uh, of the international community and pirates and, and uh, Canada and everybody in order to be able to implement this. And this is on the private se uh, sector because the private sector is also very important, but also it is very important to have work to be done on the governmental uh, level where, for example, in Gaza, there is a huge need for water for desalination. Uh, and as you know, water in, uh, in Gaza is contaminated. 90% of the water there is contaminated. And there should be an intervention from the government and from the international community in order to be able to really uh, uh, apply this and implement it. And what about the sewage uh, treatment? Sewage treatment is very a huge need, uh, where where uh, many uh, hills uh, and uh, uh, valleys in Palestine uh, are really contaminated because of the sewage and drainage that uh, settlement just make it flow into the land of the Palestinian. Uh, and uh, so there are lots of work to be done and lots of plans. Uh, now, uh, after coming from COP27, I can also see people uh, making phone calls and asking, tell us about your experience, not only uh, my organization, but also people, they are really willing to know. The church also, the church, um, I'm from the Anglican church, from St. George's Anglican church in Jerusalem. And uh, they asked me uh, to, uh, to tell the experience there. Uh, so the, I can see now that there is more awareness, more eagerness to know what is this climate change issue? What are the uh, countries gathering for? Why are they there? Is it serious? It, will they do something? And uh, I was really happy uh, with, the, with this historical uh, um, uh, decision that there will be a funds for loss and damage uh, for those countries that have been really affected, uh, affected a lot with the, the climate change issue. Uh, I ho really hope that we can do together something because uh, alone we can't do anything. It is together that we can do, do it not alone. Well, Hannah, I think you've given a, a, a long list of, of uh, areas that Canadians could <laughs> help in. And, <laughs> and, and I think, yeah, I mean, those are topics that we're dealing with too in Canada. So we can we can partner uh, together there. And so yeah. I just, um, I think we probably need to wrap up. Uh, Yvonne, anything for Canadians? Um, any message for Canadians or, or the church in Canada? Sí, voy a hablar español. Yeah, I'm going to speak in Spanish. Um, well, I think that it's very important participation in these events because you can see the things that the bad guys are doing, the evil of evil, as we say in uh, Ecuador, and those evil guys we have Canadian companies as well. We have mining companies, oil companies that have a strong lobbying in these kind of international spaces. It is also very important that Canadian churches and Cairo as part of this uh, economical coalition that they could also support 
no? organizations on land in this fight against uh, mining companies, in this case in Ecuador, and oil companies as well in Canada that are uh, present in the uh, Equatorian Amazon, Amazon area. And these mining companies that are in the Andes as well. And the Andes are very important because they are the source of clean water for millions of people that live in this mountain range. So what they've always done, what you've always done, and from the church that's organizing events, raising awareness in Canadian population that the lifestyle in Canada can be affecting or is actually affecting local populations in the South and in this specific case in Ecuador. And yeah, I wanted to, to wrap up saying that in, in this COP specifically, one of the most important topics that were discussed at the end, it actually took two days uh, more for the summit to conclude, had to do uh, the loss and damage topic. Mm. Now, Oil Watch uh, had a statement on this that's lost and damaged, lost and damaged. So with this statement, what we're trying to do is to say, it's not about asking for funds necessarily as a loss and damage that maybe for the COP context will uh, arrive as a debt or that will be connected to, I don't know, another fund. But it is important to, to, to see this idea along with uh, Canadian churches. This is something we've been working on that's acknowledging the ecological debt, the climate debt, mm -hmm. not just the climate debt because of the impact of climate change, just as um, my Palestinian colleague said, but also the local impacts that this has had, just as our uh, Colombian colleagues spoke about, but also this climate debt because of the use uh, and abuse of the environment for the CO2 emissions that somehow have allowed the industrial development of industrialized of no, countries, countries of the North, but also to speak about this climate debt that comes because of these fake solutions that uh, have been approved for some decades already in this climate change summit. For instance, the nature-based solutions like for example, projects that are offset, that the word in English is offset, uh, uh, carbon offsets, or for example, the net zero emissions and many other traps that can be uh, making this impact deeper or creating more zones of sacrifice in the South. And that's a very important thing that from Canada, they also speak about this, that they also open discussions on this of what those plans mean, where we can have governments involved, but also, of course, lots of companies and Unfortunately, lots of organizations of civil society believe that these are good ideas. They believe that they are good plans. But in reality, these plans, what they do is they perpetuate climate change on the one side, but also they create and they increase the ecological debt that countries, that industrialized countries from the North have with peoples and countries in the South. So it's lots of uh, tasks to, to denounce what companies are doing, but open the discussion as well about these ecological debts. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne. So my sisters and brothers in Canada, we have our work cut out for us. There's so much we can do to make up for this uh, climate debt. Uh, you know, it's a justice debt. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Anna, Yvonne, and for joining us, we have to end this panel now, uh, turn it over to Tony. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. And by the way, the blogs of our speakers are have been in the chat, so you can go back and get more details um, if you wish. Thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, very important words and uh, perspectives brought here. Uh, that's part of the focus, um, this uh, panel on uh, women's discussion and leadership and that importance. Uh, we're connected to a lot of uh, 
that energy and that um, focus because of uh, the work that is being lifted up. So we have a, an important uh, connection here with uh, some of the efforts of Kairos in their Orange the World campaign, the 16 Days of Activism uh, Against Gender-Based Violence and Violence Against Women and Girls from November 25th to December 10th. There is also that connection of how we are uh, bringing the lessons learned of COP27, uh, what Yvonne was mentioning about the business summit aspect and the large contingent of um, fossil fuel uh, lobbyists and others that tend to uh, dominate the conversations and do piecemeal work on, on uh, taking apart some of the energy and the uh, focus for uh, concerted climate change um, efforts and, and how we need to change systemically in, in this work. And so by continuing to lift up those voices to, to understand that we have a connection, we have a uh, commitment and a call in this work, uh, as um, Hannah was saying about the, or Iman was saying about the ecological debts, the uh, global north, uh, whose focus tends to be self-centered on preservation needs to start to understand that global frame and that our impacts and advocacy extend outside of our borders and how we are affecting the world. Uh, so we are going to next move on to our uh, second panel. Uh, we have Alicia Greenfield, the Vicar of Holy Cross Anglican Church in North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, uh, to present our next uh, panel discussion. And I'm going to turn it over to her for a uh, discussion on centering Indigenous leadership and history in climate action. Good morning. I am um, looking for my panelists. So as they are introduced, we can see who they are. Um, thank you. I see first Clifford, who did the blanket exercise um, at COP and is a blanket exercise facilitator. I see Tia, who is a policy analyst. Um, I see Paul from the Philippines, who, who focuses on campaigns and mobilization. And I know Yurstra, Yurstra who works on in, as an intern of development and peace, is also here because I saw her earlier. So I am assuming she will come. In my very brief introductions, I do not do a quarter, a fraction of justice to the incredible activities and thoughtfulness of these people. Um, Cheryl will be presenting each of the bios in the chat, and I invite you all to meet these um, delegates more fully at that time. Hi, nice to, and here is uh, Yusra. Um, to give context to the panel, in previous COP indig COPs, Indigenous voices and leadership, as well as youth voices and leadership have been marginalized and muted. An increasing number of Indigenous land and environmental defenders are being targeted and even killed when they speak to defend the environment and their communities. This means that the particular impacts of the climate crisis on Indigenous peoples, the relationships with the environment and the solutions are not being heard or taken into account, which is a heavy beginning to these questions. I'll read all three questions so that we all know where we're going. And then I will ask each of you the first question and then the second question so that we understand where we're going together. So the questions are, how was the experience for you and what is your most significant takeaway? So we'll do a round with that question. Then, what do you want to do with this experience? How will it shape your work on these issues going forward? And we'll do a round with that question. And finally, what is the value of this type, the COP gathering? Is there anything else you would add to the Canadian public? Um, so, Clifford, I would invite you to, and we're going in the random order of you appearing on my screen. Clifford, how is this experience for you? 
What was your most significant takeaway? Good morning. I want to say Mino uh, to everybody across Turtle Island and around the world, all of my relations. Uh, good evening. If uh, the sun has set on you um, in your parts. Um, Alicia, I just want to take a second and say, like, when when we were all coming on here and you said, I see Clifford, I see Tia, it almost felt like romper room, like it was like my romper room moment with the magic mirror. So, uh, you know, a taste of my childhood. So thank you for that nostalgia so early in the morning. Um, so COP was an incredible experience for myself, and I'm sure it was for many, many people. My big challenge going to COP was you know, what do I have to bring? What do I have to offer? Because I don't center my work in and around um, the environment and ecology. Um, I'm, a, I'm a graduate student in public health. I have worked in health and social services, uh, in delivery, in administration. So I come at this um, from a very different uh, place. So I was trying to figure out how to fit into that setting. And that's something that I've had to do my whole life. I've, you know, never really fit in anywhere that I've ever gone. Um, and that's, you know, been a blessing in some, in some situations, and, and it's been a challenge in others. And I think that this was, you know, uh, one of the times that it was challenging. But um, in saying that, COP for me was really transformational and transformative, uh, not just for myself uh, professionally, um, but for myself on a spiritual level and um, deeply personal. Um, as an Anishinaabe um, and someone who has been raised, uh, you know, outside of my culture, I'm actively trying to uh, rediscover and relearn my culture and our traditional teachings. So this is something that has occurred in my life, you know, over, over many, many years and many experiences help in, uh, help in that identity journey for myself and 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 cop was no different in that um in trying to figure out you know what i could offer to cop um you know i had this tool with me that i was uh offering in the civil society climate justice hub um i've facilitated many bl blanket exercises before to many different groups um and so every time you facilitate you kind of have to frame uh the exercise for the participants that you're uh, getting, for lack of a better term, um, whether that's school children, whether that's public sector employees like teachers or nurses, uh, nonprofit sector, uh, corporate, uh, you know, private private industry, I've had to I've had to do that. So I've had to figure out a way to make the blanket exercise and its message land um, for people. And that was what my challenge was for COP because I've never really had to do it around climate justice and climate action and the climate crisis. Um, we talk about land, you know, all the time in the exercise. The whole exercise is based around land and and the story of the land of Turtle Island, um, but not in terms of the climate crisis. Um, so that was a professional challenge for me, um, and in trying to you know, fulfill that responsibility for myself, I, I was really brought closer to my culture in a lot of ways as well. Um, for my people, we see ourselves as part of the land. We don't see ourselves as people living on the land. Um, we understand ourselves as being physically and spiritually connected to the land. Um, so the conversation earlier when uh, Nelson, I think, was talking to, to Juan Rachel, um, you know, talking about our neighbor and loving our neighbor. Um, that's that's a really interesting, you know, concept. Christians will ask each other, uh, you know, like, how can I love my neighbor better? Or, you know, how can I forgive, you know, 77 times, seven times? Um, our people look to everybody as our relations. We don't look at each other as neighbors or as strangers. Um, we are all relations. Uh, and we we greet each other as such. Uh, it doesn't matter whether or not your people came from Turtle Island or whether you're a visitor to these lands, uh, whose, whose ancestors were visitors to these lands or whatnot. We are all relations. Um, and so I think when we are able to see each other, not as strangers and not even as neighbors, but as family, 
um, as people who are, you know, connected to each other and connected to the land, everything that we do changes. Every policy that we develop and implement, every, you know, economic opportunity that we take uh, dramatically different, dramatically changes um, when we are able to see the land as ourselves. Um, we wouldn't extract, you know, parts of ourselves, uh, you know, for profit. Um, and so why do we do that to the land, right? Or if more people saw themselves as part of the land, what would the economy and what would policy and what would development look like? Thank you. Um, and so that's, that's how I, I, I am being a titch interrupting. So I'll give you one more sentence. The issue is I'm watching the time and knowing we have a lot of questions. And there. I want to make sure all of you are heard as fully. And again, I'll say this, Cheryl has put your blogs on the side. So, because I feel like I could listen to you for another half an hour. Um, so and I could probably talk for another half an hour. So <laughs> what so I will heard... say is that it was a transformational experience. Um, and something I'm still coming to terms with um, as I look at my work going forward. The other piece I heard, which is useful for me, is to address land and each other as relations, um, which mm -hmm. I have heard again, but to hear it again here was useful. Thank you. Paul, and, and I am so sorry if I have to interrupt. Okay. It's really hard to do. Paul. Yeah, uh, I think uh, attending COP it was also my first time attending COP and it was really a, a big, uh, very huge gathering for me. And I was there uh, a bit earlier to attend uh, the meetings of the Indigenous Peoples uh, Caucus in the world. Uh, to, uh, my main takeaway would be one, the, the connection and the, the linkage of the pressing climate crisis to the indigenous struggles, to war and militarism, to the issues of human rights, to ecumenism actually, and to the uh, larger economic crisis and the amount of solidarity across the world, uh, across different nations, peoples who are willing to face these challenges uh, in, the, the, in the whole uh, event of COP27. I think this is the linkage of issues and the people, especially, of course, with Kairos, with the First Nations from Canada that we were able to meet, and also from the U.S. and from the whole Turtle, Turtle Islands uh, was very important to me. Second, uh, I think according to the IP caucus, this is the biggest attendance for indigenous peoples, uh, this COP. And on the other hand, this is also the largest number of fossil fuel lobbyists in attendance. So, and for Canada, with standing issues on oil and gas companies and uh, issues of First Nations asserting their uh, rights to land, uh, I think the, the Canadian government uh, uh, has a lot to prove on its commitment on how to seriously fight climate change uh, and uphold indigenous people's rights and, and how it will deal uh, with its oil and gas business. And lastly, I think uh, there is always an urgent uh, and pressing need for uh, to center people's rights, human rights, and justice in 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 in, in any uh, discussions uh, on how to address climate change. Uh, sometimes we uh, think it will be automatically referred to in the documents, but no, in, in many of the language uh, outcome documents in deciding and implementing the actions, in mobilizing climate finance and climate solutions, uh, as I said earlier, not, not the false market-based solutions. Uh, there, the, these rights uh, do not come automatic, but sometimes we there is always a need to assert and push for it to be included in the many, many uh, discussions. So, yeah, I think those are in, in, in the outcomes of COP27. Those things, uh, uh, we, we, we saw it, how, how the people's organizations, civil societies has been very, very vocal, very active to be included uh, on these negotiations to, to really make their voices heard, to make human rights, people's rights, uh, indigenous people's rights, and justice to be the center of uh, the outcome of these negotiations. Thank you, Paul. Yusra. 
Yeah, I just want to start off by saying thank you to Kairos and for the love of creation for allowing me the opportunity to take part on this delegation. And it was a truly incredible experience, as I'm sure it was for everyone on our delegation. It was so wild, um, you know, growing up, like seeing Cobb like on TV or just like reading articles about it and just trying to stay up to date with everything that was happening and then actually being there like being right in the middle of all the action seeing so much happen and it was just it was it was unbelievable for me for at least the first couple of days it was I'm still kind of struggling to process all of it because so much happened and it was it was an incredible opportunity and just one thing I like to point out um it was great to see an increase in representation um for both youth and indigenous peoples and people of color in general um I definitely noticed that it has improved in recent years and this year was no exception it was absolutely incredible to see so many diverse people and so many diverse voices being represented on the cop stage um, of course, um, we can only go up from here. It's always onwards and upwards, and it's always um, something that, you know, conferences like COP can improve on. Um, it's, I'm hoping that next year we just continue to see this kind of growth and we continue to see more and more voices being represented, not just at the delegation level, but also just kind of in the negotiation rooms as well and at the decision-making levels and people actually having a seat at the table. I think I are really looking forward to that. And I really, really hope, fingers crossed, that we do see that happen. But yeah, it was it was truly a really great experience for all of the reasons that I've just described. And it just, it gave me it gave me a lot of hope. Thank you, Yusra. Tia? Um, it, yeah, it was good. It was incredible. Um, thank you to everyone at Kairos and the Love for Creation for um, all your support and being able to get me there. Uh, this was my first time experiencing COP, so it was really interesting. Um, you know, I got to meet with like people that I don't see often from Turtle Island. I got to spend some time there with them. I got to build these relationships with everyone on the delegation. Um, and um, I got to learn so much from the other delegates about the Global South, um, you know, how we have very similar experiences um, with this, with climate change um, and the way that we're impacted. And I even got to build connections with people like I didn't, I've never met before. Um, and it's, it's interesting that, you know, these people are from your own country, uh, from Canada, and you'll probably never cross paths with them, like while you're in Canada. But when you're in this little space at COP, you know, you're constantly running in and bumping into people that uh, you probably wouldn't in Canada. And yet you share so many similar interests about like, climate change and, and wanting uh, earth justice and all that sort of stuff. So I had a really great experience in terms of that. And I, I learned so, so much, but I think it, I'm also like, depending on the way you experience and you see the world, um, it, it, COP is gonna look different for everyone. Like we're hearing from all, all the delegates. And I, I'm still sort of struggling uh, with the idea of COP um, kind of reflecting on that quote from Boris, the UK uh, pres prime minister from at Glasgow last year, like, um, if these things were really working, why, why is this like our 27th uh, COP? Um, and I'm also like the youth voices, there was some indigenous youth from the states that got their bad that were debadged during the first week. So they weren't there the second week. Um, and that to me is like, you're still silencing the voices of indigenous peoples when you're doing that. 
um, the, the, the region or the, the town that it was in to me, um, it seemed like unsustainable. And I thought to myself, what if we hosted, you know, COP, it generates a lot of revenue. What if we like um, gave COP or, or hosted COP in places that are leading um, on sustainability rather than hosting them in places that just, you know, have the most money or, or bid on a uh, bid the most it, the, like that would create a, a big difference because countries would be like oh well we want more revenue so let's let's host it there um yeah so i'll try to keep it short sorry but my experience was really good and i'm also reflecting on how to keep challenging the status quo uh, because we don't have a lot of time until 2030 like there's only six years so i'm thinking about these future generations and and what what we need to do right now immediately to create that drastic change that we desperately need. Thank you, Tia. So reflecting on the experience hearing all of you, um, that there was a wealth of it, um, that there was some incredible beauty in relationships. And in relationships, um, knowing that I was a part of the virtual delegation last year, those relationships continue and that we continue to connect and to grow into those relationships. And then a diversity around most significant takeaway around the increase in diversity and the hopefulness of that on the continuing silence, uh, silencing on the challenges of, of um, Paul hearing your comments around, people say they're gonna do these things, now let's see it. Um, and Clifford, uh, the that sense of who are we, identity wise if we are all relations and in relationship with land so uh, a lot of richmond richness in that first reflection on experience so the next question i'm okay i'm going to be we have i've been told we should be done in about 20 25 minutes um and so watch me be tight here um what are you going to do with this experience and I, so I'd invite you to reflect on, on maybe one piece and I would invite everybody to save your blogs because boy, we, we'd be interested in all of us in the fullness and depth of your reflection. But if there was one thing you were gonna do with this reflection this first week, um, what would you think that would be? And I'm gonna go in the opposite direction. So Tia. Um. Yeah, one thing that I'm thinking about, um, you know, a lot of Indigenous organizations are still, even though we're, we're, the UNDRIP recognizes our rights and, you know, there's an Indigenous Peoples Caucus, they still struggle to find badges um, to enter these spaces and get accreditation. So I'm thinking about two, uh, you know, grassroots people, people within my own community that have been doing this work with the environment and being on the land for 30, 20 years, how to start bringing them into these spaces, uh, because I, I think their knowledge is really valuable. And one quote that I heard is, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So how do we keep bringing more Indigenous people to the table to start advocating and asserting our rights? Thank you. Yustra. I think like the experience has given me a lot to think about and just um, more ways that I can grow. I just, I really hope to continue having these kinds of conversations, just trying to listen to as many different voices as I can, um, prioritize listening to these voices whenever I can, and just keep thinking about ways in which, um, you know, I can play my part in helping to amplify um, these messages and at any kind of conference or in at any kind of platform, um, maybe a future cops and conferences in general. And yeah, it's like I said, it's um, something that I'm still processing and um, something that, you know, I just, again, just wanting to continue. Thank you. Paul. I think from the initial from Tia and uh, Yusra and from the initial panel, the solution is really in how peoples come together 
Uh, it's in the people's hands. So those who are mostly affected by the crisis. Thus, I think uh, I, I will carry and be motivated to act for us to more to do urgent, bold, and aggressive steps to link each other, to organize and rise together. I think through our linkages with uh, different indigenous peoples' networks, the IPM SDL network, uh, the Peoples Rising for Climate Justice, and other environmental groups. There is so much to bring back to our members, to the national and local communities. And also, there's a lot to share to the international platform on the realities of what's happening on the ground, meaning the role of indigenous peoples uh, in preserving the remaining biodiversity in the lands and waters, especially in those in their uh, ancestral territories. Thank you, Paul. Clifford. I think for myself, <clears throat> what I encourage my participants in blanket exercises to do, thinking about reconciliation, is to think about what you can do yourself in the capacity that you have. And so that is my approach to my uh, climate action efforts. Um, I can only do what I have the capacity uh, to be able to do. And for me, that might be conversations where I encourage people to have a paradigm shift. Um, Tia talks about Tia talks about the table, and if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. When I talk about reconciliation, I talk about a table as well, and I, I talk about that table needing to be reset. We can't just shuffle the chairs and the people who are there and the dishes that are being served. We have to fundamentally change what that dining experience looks like, because if we're just incorporating you know, a couple of new people and a couple of new ideas, that's not really a new way of doing things. That's just, you know, a softer, kinder, gentler colonialism. Um, we have to change what we're doing and that requires non-Indigenous people to gain Indigenous knowledge and to use that knowledge in a good way uh, and change what we're doing going forward. And that starts with a paradigm shift and I might be able to encourage that in the work that I do. Thank you very much. Um, I I heard both personal growth and building bridges. I heard paradigm shift and um, urgent and bold. On that note, the next question has two pieces. What is the value of this type of gathering, of a COP type gathering? So if you could say a sentence about that, and then two minutes. You have a you have probably some of the most passionate people, the people who are willing to get up at 5:30 in the morning just to hear what you you have to say. What would what actions or thoughts or relationships would you invite this community to explore this next year? Um, Clifford. It would be to explore that paradigm shift. It would be to challenge your inner working model and the knowledge that you have and the truths that you understand as you understand them right now and gain a different perspective and try to see yourself as part of land and then watch everything that happens um, from that point forward because um, It'll be monumental and it'll be incredibly different than what you're doing upon the land right now. So one follow-up question to you who have spent some time thinking about paradigms shift. Mm -hmm. If I believe you, I totally do, mm -hmm. that that's a piece of what we need to do next. What would be one thing you could do to shift your paradigm, which is really hard to do? that's that's difficult for me to answer in the constraints of time yeah. i i don't have a response to that uh in the moment i'm sorry well it's not fair to put you on the spot because that that is the question that i've been struggling with since i went last year so i was just you know if you had a brilliant solution i was going to borrow yours um uh, read learn that... different learn from different perspectives if it feels unsettling then you're doing it right Thank you. Paul. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the value of 
attending COP27 is still this is another just one part parcel of the opportunities uh, to forward the struggles of indigenous people. This is where the governments and companies confront. We can confront them of their historical debt to to the global south, to to, to their debt of injustice historically to the indigenous people. Yeah, and uh, coming from the Philippines, the most dangerous place in Asia for environment uh, defenders, uh, linked with uh, foreign structured businesses, foreign investments, and we have some Canadian mining companies here in our countries. Uh, I think there's definitely strong for the Canadian public to ensure that these monies, uh, with with some of the commitments of the Canadian government to the Philippines or any other uh, governments where they. Uh, channel their, the, the people's people's money, uh, basically, if it's a government one, to ensure that this money is not used to attack indigenous people's communities through false solutions. This money is not used to disregard indigenous people's rights to land, to pay, uh, people's basic freedoms, not for militarization or the terrorist tagging and criminalization of indigenous people's leaders who are resisting any exploitative projects and uh, oppressive policies. And I think uh, with everyone uh, here attending here, there is always a need for uh, support uh, to fight uh, for indigenous peoples who are, as we have said, silenced and attacked, especially linked to the grabbing of their lands and the injustices. Uh, Raise it to your government, to, to, you, to your leaders, uh, not only in COP, but in many other platforms as, as much as we can, you know, with, with, with uh, our members, with like-minded groups and institutions to, to forward uh, the voices and the fight of indigenous peoples. Well, I heard a call again to accountability um, that we as Canadians pay attention um, to where the money goes um, and that it isn't enough to sort of send it off without thinking and following, following through. I heard again um, from the prior panel um, that call to accountability for Canadians in their uh, participation, engagement um, in mining. Um, thank you. Yustra. I echo Clifford's words completely. <laughs> um, I think there is a lot of value in having COPs. Um, Things like the loss and damage fund would not have been established without participation. It would not have been established without lobbying and it would not have been established without the conversations like the ones that we're having today. Um, again, like I completely echo what Clifford said about um, unsettling being part of the process. Discomfort is a feeling that you should acknowledge and latch onto and understand when you're having these kinds of conversations and um you know I don't I always urge people to pay attention to yes the voices that are being platformed but then also pay attention to the ones that are not uh pay attention to the voices that aren't there and then actively seek them out if you can um that active portion I think is something that we've started to do a lot better in recent years and I think we should just continue doing that and yeah that's that's all from me so what I heard in terms of I heard two things one is that there is value of crop um and not to lose sight of the the pieces that do work in valid and reasonable criticism of the pieces that do not um, and then I heard a challenge to everybody who is here at this table to notice who is in your conversations and who is not, and to take action, um, which can feel uncomfortable, um, to invite voices that you are not hearing, and that that is a piece of work um, that you are asking of us at this time. Tia. Yeah, I'll just reiterate like everything that Clifford, Yusra, and Paul said. Um, I think though too, with the whole loss and damage, look, I, I'm, it's great that it's happening. It should happen. Um, it's not black or white for me. Like, yes, we need loss and damage, but we also need to keep striving for more and better changes. Um, 
we need to shift that mindset of you know loss and damage is kind of this harm reduction mentality when we just need to stop the harm period you know like and over consumption like that's a huge issue that the global north is playing a role in like living beyond our our needs and our means like that's something that i try to be mindful of every every day is just like is this something that is a want or a need like um overconsumption is a huge issue and then when we're thinking about just transition kind of what user was saying uh there was a, a panel at cop where they were talking about just transition there was no indigenous people on that panel and i don't even think they mentioned like indigenous people once like on that panel and so how do you expect our communities when we don't even have clean water to start you know getting smart cars and and um or Tesla is like, uh, you got to think about indigenous communities when we're talking about just transition too. who's being left out of these conversations, how can we support them. And then with that shift of mindset, um, what Clifford was talking about, for me, it brought me to think about, you know, love is the, the highest vibration that we can feel as human beings. And my name, my spirit name is Gunokwe, which means the golden eagle woman. And that eagle in the seven grandfather teachings, it represents love. And that represents love because it's the highest flying creature and it's closest to creator. And it has the ability to see from afar. It can see everybody's perspectives. It can carry all of those teachings. Um, so just, just always try and come from a place of love and just have the, have the uh, be willing to view multiple perspectives. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. Hearing, um, hearing the importance of just plain stopping the harm, like just stopping, paying attention to overconsumption um, here in Canada, and to end. Thank you, Tia, on love, on love in a deep. Um, sense of curiosity of other perspectives and paradigms. So thank you all so much for your reflections and your time. It is an honor to have met you and to have heard you. My understanding is uh, that there is now time for some questions for all of the panelists and that I turn it over to Tony, Cheryl and Shannon um, to host those questions. Blessings on all of your work going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia and the panel. I'm going to um, take these spotlights off. We'll go back to gallery view and see if we can talk to everyone. Oh, there we go. Um, I don't really need a spotlight either. <laughs> um, so folks, now is your opportunity. I have not yet seen um, questions in the chat. So you could put up your hand if you want to ask verbally, or you could drop a question into the chat to any of the panelists that we have heard. Now, a few of them had um, prior commitments and needed to slip away, um, but uh, the, the second panel is all um, here. I think Tia's only here for a couple more minutes. And um, let me just see from the first panel, Hannah is here um, from the first panel as well. So participants, do you have questions? There are some comments going in to the chat. Trust you're all looking at those. Now this question got written to everyone and not to a specific person. Um, 
I saw, I'm going to read out from John. I saw an interview with a politician during COP27 in which he explained the importance of keeping the pressure on officials by holding vigils, marches, letter campaigns, etc., so that they know the particular issue is still front and center in people's hearts and minds. What ways will you be going, um, keeping the climate change and human rights pressure on the decision makers going forward? I think that's a question for all of us, um, as so one of the delegates alluded to, but are there any um, of the delegates who want to share any of those pieces that you know will happen in the year to come? Or things you're, you're thinking about and wishing would happen? Tia, go ahead. I'm actually in Colorado right now. Um, I'm at going to attending a UN Human Rights Summit, and I'll be talking about traditional knowledge. So, I'll definitely be talking about um, a lot of the stuff that I said today, and that'll be keeping my pressure on the UN. Um, but besides that, we also talked to one of the Green Party members while we were in COP, Clifford, Rachel, and I, um, and we talked about doing a campaign. Um, so that's something that I'm interested in, in doing to, you know, keep that pressure on and think that's important. Um, so yeah, maybe keep an eye out for that because we could use your support definitely in the future. Absolutely. We'll keep in touch. And Tia, maybe you can stay there for a moment because I, I know that um, you also had an opportunity to talk to the Canadian Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Can you tell the rest of the audience a little bit about that and about what might come of that? Yeah, it was during a BIPOC youth uh, meeting with the Minister Stephen Gribo and um, we all had the opportunity to like share what we wanted to say and we went around the round table. A lot of people talked about, you know, the water crisis that's still um, happening, just transition. Um, yeah, there was a lot of important information that was shared with him. And then at the end, he, he mentioned that, you know, I'll never understand your frustration. And so at that point, um, I offered him um, an invitation to my community to come see that frustration firsthand for himself. Um, and he said, I accept your point, but my point was the invitation. So um, his team got my information and hopefully next year he'll be able to come and uh, we'll take him out on the land. My, my family owns a lodge out there and we're very, I'm very connected. My cousin works at the Heritage Center that does a lot of environmental work. So hopefully we can take him out. Um, he can build a relationship with the land and see it firsthand for himself. Um, because I think, yeah, that, that's something that's really important. I don't know how often these politicians actually, you know, they're so busy. How often do they actually get to go spend some time on the land um, when they're constantly advocating for the land? Like they should be building their relationship with the land to be able to do that work. So um, that was kind of my idea behind it there. What a wonderful idea. And I think that just builds on exactly what Clifford was saying, the, the need for the paradigm shift, like be on the land, of course. And we sure hoped that, um, that the government follows through on that, that uh, Stephen Gubo will actually be there. And, and if there's any way we can support that, uh, you know, if they need a little pressure to make it happen, that's what we're about. Um, and I wanted to ask all of the delegates uh, this question that Cheryl put in the, the chat, what are the top policy asks for the Canadian Minister of the Environment and Climate Change? So does anyone want to say what are the policy? I think asks? Hannah has her hand up. Yeah, great. Hannah. And if you had another point, that's okay too. Hannah, I'm not hearing you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I wanted first to answer the first question, which is um, how do we think of the future of uh, climate change? And I would like to say that uh, now I'm part of the gender policy and the environmental network, which uh, we will work more and more into brainstorming and bring uh, uh, new techniques and um, and um, 
uh, and methodologies into this. Also, we am is the par uh, part of uh, uh, many um, many partners uh, network where they are working on gender and uh, gender based violence and environmental uh, um, environmental awareness and campaigns and etc. Uh, what we would like to see is that to have more pressure on the government, on uh, the, the Israeli government, for example, to abide with its uh, uh, with the agreement that has uh, signed and ratified uh, that applies to the uh, Palestinians and also to uh, hold accountable the Palestinian government also to really move forward with uh, its implementation of the agreement that has uh, signed. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. Yes, you're welcome. Keep up the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Another suggestion in the chat was we can all go to our banks and discuss ethical banking and think about how we personally talk with our money. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Tony. Ah, actually, before we turn it back to Tony, we're going to have a, a couple of um, pieces from Cheryl in terms of what are some other actions and things we can consider. So a, a couple of announcements from Cheryl before Tony uh, will have the opportunity to close. Well, great, and thank you. And thank you to all of the delegates um, uh, for, um, you know, expressing their experiences to us. And um, there are some really invaluable insights. We, I'm really, really grateful. Um, to what you had to say. So uh, it was brought up a number of times, um, Canadian corporate accountability. We do have two uh, bills, uh, private member members bills uh, before the House of Commons. Uh, they are Bill uh, 262 and 263 um, that we're really trying to push. This is something that the government of Canada is resistant to. So we need all the pressure um, we can apply to this. Um, what we have done is we've taken that and those two bills, as well as the environmental racism bill, also a private member's bill, uh, Bill 226, um, kind of package them together in a way, um, uh, noting that uh, all of them um, do touch on the issue of environmental racism, uh, whether it's here in Canada or uh, in other countries as well, certainly in the way Canadian mining companies operate or their impacts. So we do have um, we do have a letter um, that you can easily, uh, it can take you under a minute to, you know, put your information in and off it goes, or you can also put a little bit more information in there as well. Um, I do have an update on Bill 226, the Environmental Racism Bill. Uh, the House of Commons Environmental Committee has actually approved it. It did so on November 14th. And now it is ready for third reading and final vote in the House of Commons. Not too sure when that will be, but it could be soon. So if you have not done so already, we're asking you to please contact your MP in support of this bill and the two uh, corporate accountability bills as well. And I'm asking Shannon, I already put it in the chat earlier, but uh, Shannon's putting it in the chat again. Uh, and you may want to, uh, you know, add or in, in, in that letter, um, to you know something about um really hoping that you will um vote for it when it goes to final vote um soon uh the other thing i want to mention um is that i'm sure you all know um next week is the 15th un biodiversity conference otherwise known as cop 15 it begins in a uh uh, Montreal on December 7th, and it goes to the 19th. Uh, and they will meet to determine the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, and I'm sure Shannon's going to put something in the chat about that. I do want to uh, highlight a few things, though. Um, we know that the stakes are very high, just as they are with the climate crisis. And of course, those are incredibly linked. Um, just the scale of nature loss, whether from climate change or other human development, uh, including entire ecosystems have been lost. Um, so the situation is quite dire and re requires urgent attention. Uh, the Laudato Sea Movement of Canada, 
will be at COP15 and together with the International Laudato Si movement, it has been gathering support for a Healthy Planet, Healthy People petition uh, calling on political leaders at COP15 to tackle the climate emergency and biodiversity crisis together. Promise no more biodiversity collapse for at least 50% of the Earth's lands and marine areas be protected for nature by 2030. Ensure equitable global action, including support for those most affected and, and equally and very important, protect and respect human rights, including the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities in climate and biodiversity. You can sign this petition. Uh, they will be taking it to COP15. Um, and Shannon will put that petition in the chat. Uh, and one more final thing, and this is for groups. Groups can sign on to an international multi-faith response to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework by visiting on an online forum. The deadline for that is December 5th. Um, and Shannon, are you able to put those? Okay, great. Awesome. And that's for me. Thank you. Over to you, Tony. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everyone for their participation today, for your participation in uh, Sharm El Sheikh, and for the work of Kairos uh, as they uh, moved forward with the uh, accreditation of the United Church to, to represent um, our interests and the interests of faith communities and the work of inclusion for the youth delegation, for the uh, delegation of Indigenous people and the work that continues, especially with uh, the inclusion of women's voices, women's leadership, very important part of how we are coming together as more of a coalition of, of groups and our uh, concerted efforts as we continue this work of uh, climate advocacy and climate justice, the work that, uh, as we heard, uh, will continue in Montreal and the work that will continue into the next year. Uh, we encourage all of the participants, delegates, and others to um, help and submit um, when you have events and things coming up, when you have um, blogs, as we've seen from, from Clifford, uh, very important to, to maintain our connection and our um, uh, work through social media and other uh, ways that we support one another, that we are not alone in this effort to promote change, to promote leadership, to promote um, a sustainable world and the work of our uh, different interests to bring together in one voice that we can uh, have a uh, an effect or marginal um, incremental changes that are being proposed that we have more of a, a, a voice within that represents where we are going and where we are heading as a community, as a nation, and as a, a global interest. So very thankful for all those from uh, the various areas that came and took part, that came and offered their uh, words and perspectives, having um, brought a different experience and a different understanding to this group, and a call for uh, more work on ourselves, more work in our support of those in the Global South and other areas, the interests that we leverage here from um, the Global North and the interests of the companies and, and in, um, lobbyists and groups that advocate in our government that we need to parallel with our own uh, work and we need to ensure that we are doing our campaigns, that we are doing our letter writing, that we are doing our advocacy in our communities and to our leadership, that we have um, a voice within this and that a call to um, participate and really make that effort as we are trying to help the future, help those future generations that will uh, ultimately um, find the benefit of what we are doing today. So we want to thank everyone and, and give a a short blessing to everyone for uh, their time here and, and moving forward. Uh, we will, of course, have other uh, information and other sessions that come up. Um, when I went to um, uh, Madrid and as the 
um, delegation for Glasgow, the um, I think a part of that was that feeling that we needed to continue to um, be present and to participate, to help out. And so very happy to, to be here to do that as well. But uh, for those that are uh, part of this new family of people through, through the COP experience, uh, encourage you to to continue to reach out or continue to uh, build on the relationships and the uh, the experience the advocacy very important for uh, how we move forward how we understand the world um, it's a very uh, trying and I think um, frustrating experience to go to COP and to uh, try to find space for advocacy work with those that are uh, struggling with a lot of the issues, especially from who come representing um, interests of Indigenous people or places that are not generally recognized and don't have leadership within that uh, forum to say what they need to say. So uh, we pray for them as well. We pray for all of those that are uh, here and, and all those that are yet to come. So let us pray. Greater God, you are our light, you are our guide. You set us upon creation to be part of this world, to integrate our knowledge with the knowledge that you have hidden in every leaf and every flower. And we know that as we grow and learn from this creation and your works, we will find a better balance to be here in this land in a way that is helpful and nurturing and sustaining. For all these things and all these gifts that you have given us, we give gratitude and thanks. And for all the challenges that are yet to come, we hope that we will support one another and be in community as we grow into our calling and our purpose for the future. Help us and be with us as we experience trials and troubles and challenges. We know that together we work better and that we work in a more concerted effort that will make serious change for our future. Blessing to all of those that traveled safely to the, their destination and back. Blessing for all of those as we enter into this season, uh, that they might find blessing, that they might find encouragement, and that they might be energized for the future as they take time to be with family, to be with their community, and to support and share with one another. Om Chagazi Twan Chazi Jesus Christ when Chapar Chazi. The Chagawaka Wahogu Harichin the reason the Rigi Chabichin. Nagahaz Nagu Chatne Ichiat. Amen. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It was nice uh, seeing you today and for the discussion also. Thank you, Tony, and all the delegates and everyone who came. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone.